Welcome off to lunch, everybody. Um, my name is Ray. I'm one of the radiology registrars at Roll Free. So this is probably the more, more interesting and less um, gen general talk of this afternoon that I'm going to do. Uh, it's mainly introducing you all to basic anatomy and concepts of CTs. And I remember distinctly when I was a final year medical student uh, three, four years ago, and when I started as an FY1, I realized very quickly how important um, CT was to make a diagnosis, um, especially in the acute setting, as well as in the chronic setting of um, understanding malignancy. So having an appreciation of what how CT works, what it can help you with, and having a good solid anatomical understanding of it can make you much better on the wards. And you might be at this level when you're near the end of your foundation year training that you may be able to pick up some stuff before the report even gets issued. So especially those of you guys who are really interested in radiology, this might be quite a good introduction because I know for a fact when I was in a medical school, um, we weren't really taught much about how to look at a CT. And I think it's really important now, CT is becoming so widespread that having an understanding of the anatomy and what common pathologies that we need to look out for and how they present on um, cross-sectional uh, studies, it will, will help you a great deal. Okay, so without further ado, let's talk about how CT works. So CT is basically a very, um, hi, sorry. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I thought I was cutting off. Yeah, so sorry. So the way CT works is it's basically a very, it's a more complicated version of an x-ray. In an x-ray, I'm sure um, the previous speakers have uh, covered it, you have a uh, x-ray source or an x-ray tube and you have a detector and it's basically one one view you have one detector and one x-ray tube and you have one two-dimensional image in ct you have a three-dimensional image where you have multiple detectors uh, behind the patient and an x-ray tube in front of the patient and the x-ray x-rays are produced from the tube they pass through filters to make sure any uh, non-useful x-rays are filtered out then they then they are targeted in a beam by a collimator, which basically prevents, make, makes the x-rays more focused rather than all scattered in different places. And then you have this uh, detector array, which rotates around the patient. And this is what happens in modern CT scanners. You have multiple detectors. What you can do with this technology is that the x-ray and the detectors can rotate around the patient and you can get three-dimensional represent, representation of, of the patient. And what happens is, is that you have multiple x-rays which form at different angles, and then retrospectively, you can reconstruct the image later. And therefore you can, with clever uh, funky algorithms, which I won't cover in great detail, you can essentially get a reconstruction from comp compiling multiple x-rays together. And that's basically one run rotation is equal to one slice. So normally a CT takes about 10 to 15 minutes to perform. Um, the modern technology with multiple detectors and this fast speed of acquisition means that we can get CT scans done very early and they're very useful. The thing which about CT which you need to keep in mind is uh, similarly in X-ray, the properties of how X-rays are absorbed depends directly on the density of the material. So we, we describe them as Hanfield units or on, on the Hansfield scale, whereby less dense materials such as air will have a, a negative reading and appear black because they will transmit a lot of the x-rays and not absorb many x-rays. Um, as you can see, the lungs here are black and have a Hansfield value of less than a thousand, whereas bone will absorb much more and will have a Hansfield unit of more than a thousand. And in between where you have that gray area, um, there are specific council unit values. And this is what radiologists use to determine what's blood, what's water, what's soft tissue, and what's um, simple fluid versus soft, uh, versus a malignancy. Um, and that, that is what, simply what we do, if we're really not sure about what something is or what something um, it turns up that we don't expect, we literally put a cursor on it and find, that, find out the Hansfield unit value and then correlate okay, this looks like it's water, this looks like it's fat. And that's how we're able to understand what pathologies are and able to characterize them a bit better. So having an understanding of this as a radiologist is quite important because you can, as you can see, simply differentiate acute blood from simple fluid 
because the Haskell unit value of acute blood is higher and therefore it will appear more dense versus simple fluid, okay? Which I'll discuss in, a, um, in my next couple of slides. Some very important rules about CT is that we're viewing the images from toe to the head in the axial view. So the axial view is basically, you're taking a transverse cross-sectional view. And what we're doing is looking, if you imagine, from the patient's foot to the patient's head. That's, that's the way the images are taken. Dense areas will absorb more x-rays and will be brighter, and less dense areas will absorb less, less x-rays and will be darker, okay? And another really important point in CT, especially when you're starting off, is areas which are dying or dead, okay? So infarct or um, scar tissue, which are dead, will mean that they won't take up much contrast because they will be less vascular and therefore will will also appear lighter. That's very important to know, okay? So wherever blood goes, blood will be bright. And wherever things are dying, or like, for example, infarcts, they will be lighter. That's a very important thing to know because they're less vascular and therefore are less dense and will take up contrast less. And I'll tell you why that's important in the next few slides. So before we do anything, the, the main thing about CT is that it's important to know the anatomy and then followed by that, you need to know the pathology before you can actually interpret the radiology. So let's talk a bit about the anatomy of a CT head. This is the most commonly investigated investigation, um, cross-sectional investigation in the hospital. So it's important to know what are some landmarks. So I'm going to go through some important ones here and then we'll have some Q and A's later. So starting on from the top right, this is, this is a sleeve CT slice from the top of a patient's skull. So just imagine I've taken a slice just above the person's eye and it's in the forehead region. So what you see right at the front is the right frontal lobe. So this is, we're looking from the toe to the head of the patient at the level of the forehead, right? This thing here is the bone. This thing, this thing here is the occipital bone. And right here we have the frontal lobe. Separating the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe is, some, is this groove here known as the central sulcus. All right, so you have two central sulci, one on this side, on the right-hand side, one on the left-hand side here. And is immediately, it's very important to appreciate that on this slice alone, how far back the parietal lobe is, okay? So it's very easy to make the mistake calling this the uh, occipital lobe. But in fact, when you're taking an image so high up, it's the parietal lobe. And we know that based on, if we look at our anatomy, this, and we take a higher image, we won't take up the occipital lobe, we'll only, image the parietal lobe at this level. And you have the central sulcus, which separates the parietal and uh, the frontal lobe. And it's important to identify this central sulcus landmark because from uh, anatomy and physiology, we know that the pre-central gyrus or the pedunculated tissue of brain is also known as the primary motor cortex and the post-central gyrus right here is known as the primary sensory cortex. And if you have a lesion, for example, if you're querying that someone's got a, um, a neurological defect, either it's sensory or motor, depending on where you think the defect is, we can also specifically look at this area to find out if there's a pathology. So that's really important for all radiologists and juniors to actually appreciate to this anatomy. In between the two lobes, uh, in two lobes of the hemisphere, we have an interhemispheric fissure or the medial longitudinal fissure. That separates the two, uh, the left and right cerebellar hemis uh, cerebral hemispheres. And then you have this structure here, this triangle shaped structure at the posterior aspect of the brain, which is known as the superior sagittal sinus. And sometimes we can see a filling defect or a clot there, um, which indicates a venous sinus thrombosis. So this is at a much higher level of the brain. Now we, we're moving a bit down. So just imagine now we're moving towards the uh, just a bit more inferior at the level of the eyebrow. Okay. Um, on the top, right on the top left sorry we have the anterior horn of the lateral ventricle and this is the right lateral ventricle and then by simple anatomy this one will be the posterior horn or the lateral ventricle the this little rim here separating the two lateral ventricles is known as the septum pellucidum okay and this calcified region here in the posterior horn of the lateral ventricles which we see 
almost 100% of the time in people is known as the choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus is a very important um, structure within the lateral ventricles, which makes the CSF and it's often calcified. So very important to note that this is not, br this is not blood. This, this is bright because of calcification, just like bone. Bone has a lot of calcium and it will be bright, okay? Now we're moving a bit more down, more, more inferiorly. And here, just inferior to the lateral ventricles, we see this opening here. This is the third ventricle, uh, which is situated in between the thalamus. We have this fissure here in between the frontal lobe and this lobe here, which is the temporal lobe near the ear called the sylvian fissure, okay? So very important to know, this level you see the sylvian fissures, you see the temporal lobe here, and then you see the frontal lobe with, with the sylvian fissure separating both of them and the openings of the third ventricle where the lateral ventricles drain into. This structure here is the midbrain, the reason we know it's the midbrain because it looks like a Mickey Mouse. So this is the head, this is, these are the ears, and it looks like a Mickey Mouse. And it's just at the level of the third ventricle. And posteriorly, we see this new structure, which has a lot of striations in it, which we call folia. And this is the cerebellum. Okay. And the separating the brain and the cerebellum is this, this faint outline here, which we can't really appreciate that well on this image, but we call that the tentorium cerebelli. So that we're at the level, we're reaching the tentorium and coming into the posterior fossa. Now we're going a bit more down now. Once again, we see the sylvian fissure on the right side, and then we see this space just underneath the frontal lobe and inferior to the third ventricle. We call that the supracellar cistern. The reason we call it the supracellar cistern, so a cistern is a, an, a space which contains CSF. We call it the supracellar cistern because it's above the cella tersica, which holds the pituitary gland. So this cross-shaped ar uh, arrangement that you see on the CT scan, this cistern here is called the supracellar cistern because it's above the pituitary gland. We then have this vessel here, which runs on the lateral aspect of the supracellar cistern in between the frontal and the temporal lobes in the sylvian fissure known as the right middle cerebral artery, okay? And when sometimes we have infarcts, this area here can appear quite bright, okay? That's probably come some, sometimes the first sign that an infarct is about to happen in the MCA territory when you have a bright MCA sign. Just posterior to the supracellar cistern, we have this rounded structure which forms part of the brainstem, which is the pons. And we know it's the pons because just posteriorly to it, we see this opening here, which is the fourth ventricle. So to know it's the pons, we, need to, we, we, we know that it's firstly smooth and it's behind the supracellar cistern. And we see this cerebellum behi right behind it. And in between the pons and the cerebellum, we have this opening of the fourth ventricle. And anterior to the, the pons, we have the basilar artery, which arises from the two vertebral arteries that are more inferiorly. So that's the basic anatomy. And uh, the reason I'm, I introduced this to you is because when we're looking at the basic pathology of the seat from CT head, we need to appreciate the anatomical significance of that. And there's certain areas, like the ones I mentioned, we look at to identify what pathologies we're going to see. So I'm just going to open the poll. If someone can open the poll for me, please, I would great, greatly appreciate that. This is a case of a patient who had trauma to the head and presented to A&E. I would like you to all to tell me what do you think this patient's pathology is? So I'll give you a few seconds. Great, so can we stop the poll? And, oh, okay. So majority of people thinks it, it's a subdural hemorrhage. I understand why you said that. I really do understand why you said that. But this is a, this is a very difficult situation um, and it can put you under a lot of pressure, but it's actually not the sub, it's not a subdural hemorrhage. It's actually a uh, extra dural hemorrhage which actually I have not put on here. So I'm really sorry about that. I'm not sure why um, I labeled it incorrectly, but this is an extra dural hemorrhage. Um, 
So I'll tell you why it's an extra dual hemorrhage. So uh, uh, apologies for the, the poor labeling um, that I did there. So this is a, a, a bleed on the right side of the patient's brain. So this is the frontal lobe. And as you can see on the, we see the bone right here and we see inferior to the bone, we see this lentiform shaped region. Lentiform means lens looking um, shaped region. And this is very characteristic of an extra dural hemorrhage. Okay, um, the, the main features of an extra dural hemorrhage is that it's lens shaped and that it does not cross sutures. So if you remember from your anatomy of the, the skull, the, the most outer part of the dura where is actually connected to the fissure, the, to the, um, to the, the, the joining of the two of the bones. So uh, the sutures essentially. So what an extra dural hemorrhage will do, if you have a bleed, it will not cr uh, cross the suture lines because the, the, the most outer layer of the dura is connected directly to the suture line. So you'll have this, when the blood starts to collect, you'll form a lens shape, a lentiform appearance. What you also see is you see soft tissue swelling superficial to this lens shape region. Um, and it's very difficult to appreciate on this, but we can actually change the settings of a CT scan and make it make the bones more visible. And we call it windowing. We can put this on a bone window and we see that there's a fracture here of the right frontal bone. So this patient has an extra dural hemorrhage, um, second, uh, secondary to a fracture of the right frontal bone. And it's also very important to appreciate here that the, the secondary effects of a hemorrhage. So whenever someone has a hemorrhage, look for other ancillary features of some of severity. And one thing we see here, we, we see localized mass effect. The reason we know it's mass effect is because one, you see shifting of the ventricles or also known as midline shift. So if I was to draw a line from here to here, right? From this end to this end, we should see the septum pellucidum in line with it, but we don't see that. We see a shift of about five to six millimeters to the, le up to the opposite side. In, on top of that, a very subtle feature we see is that if you see the sulcal um, spaces here, you can definitely see some sulcal spaces in between the gyri of the brain, right? But on the, on the right-hand side, we see sulcal effacement, which means that the sulci are so crowded and the brain is under such pressure that it compresses together. So you don't see the spaces in between the brain tissue. So we call this sulcal effacement on the right-hand side with left-sided midline shift. So this is a very bad sign. And this is what we call um, a, an impending sign of herniation. And this is a classic example of subfalcine herniation. Fine. So can you open the poll? Hopefully this is labeled properly. Um, yes, it is. So this is another case of a patient who's had trauma. So I'd like you all to tell me what type of bleed this is. So I'll give you 10 seconds. Okay, let's close the poll for me. Excellent. So majority of you guys got it correct. It's a right-sided subdural hemorrhage. Okay, another common feature. So the, the history this patient normally will present with is a patient who has an insidious onset of um, confusion, multiple falls, perhaps an alcoholic, and perhaps someone who is on anticoagulation therapy. And, and a that's a classic history of a subdural hemorrhage. It's a right-sided subdural hemorrhage. And the reason we know subdural hemorrhage, it is crescent-shaped, uh, whereas extradurals are lentiform-shaped. Um, and it will cross the suture lines because it's in inferior to the outer layer of the dura and, and therefore will not be bound by the suture lines. And therefore it will can cross multiple lobes and can cross the suture lines. Once again, this, uh, this subdural hemorrhage this acute subdural hemorrhage is causing mass effect by causing sulcal effacement on, in the right hemisphere of the brain and also causing a midline shift. As you can see, the, the lateral ventricles on, on the right-hand side are completely compressed. And so uh, the anterior and posterior horns of it and, and the septum pollution all, is all the way here. 
So you have a acute subdural bleed causing sulcal effacement and evidence of mass effect with left uh, sided uh, midline shift. Another really bad sign. And we the reason we know this is acute versus chronic subdural is because bl acute blood appears white because it's much more dense on the CT. Chronic blood, so you sometimes you will see people with chronic subdural hemorrhages, it will be less bright because it will dissolve. So very, very important. So not only is it important to identify the abnormality, but also see how severe it is based on the ancillary features. So excellent, well done guys. Um, this one came up actually in my OSCE. Um, so very important to know. So my OSCE station was, uh, please look at the CT head, this was in finals, and you have a list of bleeps. Please describe the CT head to them and make a referral using SBAR. So this, this is the exact picture that came up. So, you know, this had some good, but, you know, stressful memories with the, uh, associated with this image. So if you could open the poll for me, please. Hopefully you guys will get it right. Okay, that's wonderful. Can you close the poll? Let's see what you guys said. Uh, where's the poll results? Do you have them here? Excellent. Great. So majority of you guys got it right. Again, you, you guys are really good um, for your stage. Um, it's a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So subarachnoid hemorrhage is, so the subarachnoid layer is the most, um, it is basically a space in between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. So the pia mater lines the brain and you have the arachnoid mater. And in between that, you have this space and the systems of the brain, if you remember from the anatomy I told you, are essentially have sub, are, are part of the subarachnoid space and they will collect blood in the event of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So as you can see here, this is the, remember the supracellar system where you have the interhemispheric fissure, the sylvian fissure on each side. And then you have this, this Mickey Mouse structure, which is better outlined because of the blood um, surrounding it in this system here, which is, you don't need to know this, but this is the ambient system and this is the quadrigeminal system. So essentially the systems of the brain, which contain CSF, i.e. the subarachnoid space, are filled with an acute white um, hyperdense substance, which is blood. And this is classic of star, of star, the star sign of a, an acute subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is um, either secondary to trauma, or it could be secondary to some people who have aneurysms of the brain. So very, the most common, the, most, the next most important step after identifying a subarachnoid hemorrhage is to see if there's an aneurysm that um, interventional neuroradiologists can coil. And the way we do that is we give contrast to the brain to highlight the vessels. And in the, we'll be able to see on a CT angiogram, which is a contrast enhanced arterial phase image of the, of the circle of Willis, we'll be able to see if there's a bleeding aneurysm there. So, um, that's the management and that's how a sub subarachnoid hemorrhage presents. Interestingly, subarachnoid hemorrhages can also cause uh, mass effect and cause hydrocephalus, which in this study, you don't actually get to appreciate, but they can also, because imagine if there's blood in that CFC space, you can also prevent the drainage of the subarachnoid, um, the fluid within the subarachnoid spaces, and that can cause acute hydrocephalus. So that's something to also look out for when you have a suspicion of subarachnoid hemorrhage. Well done. Um, so now this is a patient who's hypertensive, uh, comes to A&E with confusion. Um, I've seen actually quite a few of these. So one thing I'll say, if you're ever unsure in a hypertensive patient um, and they're confused, always have a low threshold of doing a CT head because you never know what you might find. So this is a case which I've seen at least twice in my practicing life. So if you could open the poll and let me know what you guys think, what the diagnosis is here. Okay, close the poll for me, please. 
Great. So a majority of you guys said intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Yeah. So this is a intraparenchymal hemorrhage because it's within the brain. And more specifically, it's in the left basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia surround basically the lateral ventricles. You have the head of the chordate here. You have the a lentiform nucleus, which contains the putamen and the globus pallidus here. And this very dark line here going, going in between them is known as the internal capsule. So this area here, or this area here is known as the basal ganglia. And it's a common place for hypertensive bleeds to happen. Uh, so you can see a very hyper enhancing ble bleeding le region here. And what's also important to appreciate is the blood is also tracking in into the uh, left lateral ventricle and it's pulling in the uh, the posterior horn of it and that can happen in um, any acute bleed within the brain especially intraparenchymal bleeds and that's a very bad sign that's a sign that you need to basically call the neurosurgeons and talk, tell them about this because this patient can quickly get hydrocephalus because this blood can stop the drainage of the CSF so this is uh, an interesting case of a left-sided uh, basal ganglia hemorrhage with intraventricular extension. Um, that's uh, an emergency, essentially, commonly in hypertensive bleeds. So now I'm going to give you this case. So this patient came in with a headache. I'm not entirely sure if he's had trauma. Um, so I would like your opinion as to what you think this is. This is quite difficult. I've made it difficult on purpose, but let's see what you guys think. Okay, close the poll for me, please. Mm, wonderful. So I think people are using common sense here by using process of elimination. And if you are, if you actually know why this is a brain tumor, it's absolutely outstanding at your stage because this is not the best in modality to investigate that. But the, the reason we can confidently say this is not a bleed is because we don't see a hyper-enhancing lesion. Right? We don't see something really bright and acute like blood. We see this area here, which is too bright. You know, it looks more like the bone. So this is, this is what we call calcification. Um, and if you, if you are to appreciate here, um, what we notice here is first, we see this very ill-defined hypodensity in the right parietal lobe, causing sulcal effacement, because as you can see on this side, the sulci, you can see, but here they're very crowded and tight. So there's sulcal effacement, there's left-sided midline shift with compression of the right ventricle, okay? And what we also see is this interface between the gray and white matter, okay? So in simple terms, in CT, white matter, which is closer to the ventricles, is less dense, so it appears black, and the gray matter is on the periphery and appears white. So it's a bit odd to think about it, but it's the opposite in CT, just based on density. So this, this what I'm trying to say here is there's edema, which is extending into the white matter only and causing essentially compression to the gray matter. So we know this is an intraparenchymal lesion with a bit of calcification, causing mass effect, is causing what we call a vasogenic edema, which is a characteristic appearance where it only affects the white matter and does not uh, cause it, uh, it, it preserves the differentiation of gray and white matter. Which, what we, which is what we call vasogenic edema. And this is very characteristic of a brain tumor. When we give contrast, so this is, the, uh, this is why contrast is our friend in radiology. When we give contrast, we see this irregular, ill-defined um, rim-enhancing lesion within the parietal lobe, extending closely to the right basal ganglia, causing left side amygdaline shift, compression to the right ventricle, and this quite, quite a significant surrounding vasogenic edema. What's important to know, the great white matter differentiation, so between the, the gray matter and the white matter, is preserved. And that's classical vasogenic edema. And putting all these findings together, we know it's a brain tumor. And um, in this, in, with the history of insidious onset of headache um, and confusion, the most likely cause is going to be a glioblastoma. But it, when, if you ever do radiology and if you, were, uh, if you read further, there's lots of causes of ring enhancing lesions. Um, there's a wide variety, which includes abscesses, tuberculomas, toxoplasmosis. You, you can have radiation necrosis. Um, there's met metastatic deposits can cause rim enhancing lesions. But give a, a solitary history in an old person of a slowly growing mass and slow, slowly developing heading is very classic of a glioblastoma. But the fact that you've described it as a brain tumor is a big deal. Okay, so that's very important. 
moving on to the next one. Um, so this is a patient who comes in with um, weakness. So if you could open the poll up for me, please. What do you guys think this is? Great, let's close the poll. Wonderful. Um, most of you got it right, once again, left MCA infarct. So this is a classic thing which, you know, if you have the history in front of you of a patient with right-sided weakness, this is the first place you'll look for. Does this patient have an MCA infarct? Um, the reason it's MCA infarct is firstly, we need to know about the arterial anatomy of the brain. Um, so the an anterior cerebral artery, which comes off the circular willis, supplies the medial aspects of the frontal, frontal lobes. Then you have the majority of the temporal lobe and some parts of the frontal lobe uh, supplied by the MCA. And then the occipital lobe and, and the posterior part of the parietal lobe um, are supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. These areas here, part of the basal ganglia, they're supplied by something called lenticular striae arteries. And these are branches of the MCA. Um, so sometimes you can have small infarcts you know, in, basal, in, uh, in the basal ganglia, called, which we call lacuna infarcts. But this is quite an extensive uh, infarct involving the left MCA territory. Because we, and we know it's an infarct because like I told you, dying areas or infarcted areas look less dense because they're less vascular and they'll take up. And, they, and what they will do, they will cause problems in differentiating between gray and white matter. So we call that loss of gray white matter differentiation. If am I able to convince you on this um, on this image that on this side you can clearly see the differentiation between the white matter centrally and the gray matter peripherally, but here it becomes a bit more irregular. Okay, and so this is one of the this is loss of gray white matter differentiation in the left frontoparietal region, which is in keeping with a left MCA stroke. Okay, and we know. We know in this, this pattern of loss of gray white matter differentiation is secondary to edema, which we call cytotoxic edema. It's different to vasogenic edema. Vasogenic edema is extracellular, so fluid seeps out, but it doesn't cause loss of gray white matter differentiation. Cytotoxic edema is intracellular edema, whereby cells die, and then as a result, there, there becomes a lot of intracellular fluid and edema, and we lose that gray white matter interface. So this is this is cytotoxic edema. This patient also had um, a very bright left MCA artery, if you can see here compared to this side. So this is in keeping with a, an acute thrombus within the left MCA. So this patient has an acute stroke. And uh, if they're meeting the criteria of the four hour target, they should be referred to uh, uh, urgently for thrombolysis. So left MCA infarct, a very interesting case. So before we move on to the next section, I've got a few questions that I've got here. How do you know if it's a right-sided subdural? Um, I think that refers to the subdural case we had. Um, so we know it's a right-sided subdural because of simple anatomy. If we're looking from the toe to the head, just imagine looking at someone's toes to their head, then this side will be right and this right side will be left. And we know it's subdural because it's lentiform shaped. So it's definitely going to be a right-sided subdural hemorrhage and it's acute because of bright blood. So I hope that answers your question. Um, the second question is, in, in the CT head of subarachnoid and intraparenchymal hemorrhage, what is the black space in front of the head? So um, I assume you're talking about this area here, right? If it's not, then just, shout out on, on the chat. But this area here is a very normal anatomy. This is called the frontal sinus of the brain. Um, good, that's very good spot actually, because uh, it, it does look a bit off if you haven't seen that many CT heads. Um, but this is, uh, this is basically the, a normal configuration of the frontal sinuses. And um, there's loads of paranasal sinuses, which I haven't covered in this topic because it's a bit too complex. Um, and yeah, so the, that if, if they get filled with fluid, that can either be signs of chronic or acute sinusitis, or sometimes you can have fractures involving these bones and you can have fluid going into these areas. But that fluid will be quite bright. Um, sin sinusitis 
uh, fluid is a, a bit less bright than blood. So that, they are the frontal thymuses. Um, please, could you go through what is left and right on the CT head? Um, so left and right on the CT head. So anything, let's go on to the normal CT head stuff. Let's go here, okay? So this side here is right, this side here is left. And we'll, that's because we're looking from the, from the patient's feet towards the head. Just imagine, let's say you're, um, let's say, just imagine someone, your best friend is lying on the bed, okay? And their feet are facing towards you. So you're looking that way. Um, so this is right side and this is left side, okay? Do you describe midline shift as which side it's going to or coming from? Very good question. So let's go to the midline shift case. So is this one. Um, well, the midline shift is actually describing the side it's going to. So I will call this left-sided midline shift because it's coming from the right. The right-sided pathology is causing a left-sided midline shift. And it's important to measure the midline shift. So we draw a line from this part here, the frontal bone, to the occipital bone right in the center, and then basically measure from th the middle towards the, to the septum pellucidum. Okay, so that's wonderful. Great, so I don't think there's any more questions um, for now. Let's move on to thorax. So what I would like to tell you, this is probably the most chunky part of the talk. CT heads are commonly examined in um, OSCEs and um, generally when you start work. And it's important to know what, what looks abnormal and what looks normal, okay? So that you can guide management quicker. So by the end of FY2, I could look at CT head and I could tell straight away that this is a bleed. And I was already, before the report was coming, um, I was um, alerting relevant teams. And it, it just helps, it just improves the patient care a bit better, makes them go to the center, the tertiary center that they're supposed to go in at a faster rate. Um, so having an appreciation of that, Will help you throughout your life okay so let's go to ct thorax so this is a slightly a bit more complicated so we'll take it a bit more slowly um so the ct thorax there's a bit more structures to deal with for today's session i would like you to completely avoid thinking about and getting confused about all of these things here yeah even you know even uh, as a radiologist uh, we you know sometimes have to go through and double check what, what these things are. And these things are basically muscles. So pectoralis major here, and then you have the, um, the four muscles of the shoulder, uh, and then like the deltoid and all these things. So don't worry about that. What we need to worry about at your stage is how, what are the main structures on the CT chest that we look at and what are the key pathologies? So this is a contrast enhanced CT head. You can know it's contrast because these circular things here, right, are vessels. And we're quite high up in the CT head. We're basically just below. So this is the this is the manubrium of the sternum. So we're basically at the level of around T2 slash T3 area, probably yeah, T2 area. So it's quite high up. We see these three vessels coming here, and we see these two dark structures here, and we see these two big lungs here. All right. And it's contra these vessels are contrast enhanced with iodine. This big vessel here is the brachiocephalic trunk, right? This is the left common carotid artery, and this is the left subclavian artery. So this is a very common thing you'll see on the CT head, all right? Um, so, sorry, CT chest. So just appreciate that you have these three vessels coming off the aortic arch. So we're quite we're above the aortic arch at this level. Then these two black structures here, right behind the brachiocephalic trunk, this big one here is the trachea, Okay, and if you were to trace this all the way up, it will go up to the patient's head, um, sorry, neck area. So we know this is the trachea. So if you were to trace this up and just posterior lateral on the left hand side of the trachea is this structure here, which is the esophagus. Okay, so we're quite high up here. We haven't even got the, to the descending aorta yet, right? It is, it's really high up, but it's very important to appreciate this so that you can orientate yourself. Okay, and this thing here, this, this is a bright vessel here. All right. This is actually a vein. It's difficult to appreciate that, but this the way that it, this image is taken, we've taken uh, this is a continuation of that, this vein here. And what we've done is put contrast into this vein. And that's why this looks really bright. And that's, that's because the contrast is coming up the patient's right arm and then eventually going into the um, right atrium, then pulmonary trunk, then the left atrium, then into the left ventricle, and then going up into these arteries trees so this one appears brighter because that's where most of the contrast is filling all right so don't worry about this too much sometimes you will see this but that's just one of the veins so this is to appreciate where we were so we, we were basically at 
this level here, just here, where we saw the brachial cephalic trunk, which is the enominate artery. That's another name for it. You saw the trachea, you saw the esophagus, and you see the left subclavian, and you see the left common carotid artery just above the aortic arch. Now let's take it a bit, a bit further. Let's, let's cut a cross section here, just at the level of the aortic arch. So that's what we have here. So at the level of the aortic arch, just imagine I've just cut that here. You have this vessel here, which is a venous structure just on the right-hand side of the aortic arch, and that's known as the superior vena cava. Now this is a common landmark to know because sometimes you'll have patients with lung cancer and you will want to know, yeah, have, have their superior vena cava been obstructed? And the first thing you need to do is look for the aortic arch, look, find the superior vena cava and see if, this, if it's got clot in it. So this one is quite well patent, so it's, it's not obstructed. So this is, this is known as a superior vena cava. On the left-hand side of this is the aortic arch. Just imagine I've taken a cross-section of that just here. That's the exact appearance you will see. And then once again, that's, that's the trachea and that's the esophagus. All right, so fairly easy. This is the right lung and this is the left lung. Okay, so imagine another image to just to help you. Imagine if I took a cut through here, just through here. What you'll see is the aortic arch, you'll see this, the superior vena cava, and you will see the trachea and the esophagus at the back, but you won't see any part of the heart yet. Now imagine I'm now taking a cut here, just here. Now this is where stuff gets a little bit more tricky, so just bear with me. Just imagine I've taken a cut here. So you're, you're losing the aortic arch. You're kind of losing the superior vena cava, depending on the patient's anatomy. Sometimes people's superior vena cava is a bit lower, but this is really important to know. So now this is a bit complicated. So now we have on the right, the superior vena cava. We have the aorta here, right at the front, or, or the ascending aorta, okay? And then right to the left of the aorta, we have what we call the pulmonary trunk. And we know it's the pulmonary trunk because it's on the left of the aorta and it's got this classic Y, upside down Y-shaped appearance. Whereas the aorta, what it will do, it will loop round and come down here to the descending thoracic aorta. Okay, so we're a bit lower down now. So we have the SVC, ascending aorta, pulmonary trunk, and we have this here region here, which is the bifurcation of the trachea into the right main and the left main bronchus, which is known as the carina. Now this image is important because when we put contrast into the pulmonary circulation, right? So you can see here, this is the pulmonary trunk here, and we put contrast into pulmonary circulation. That's what we call a CTPA. So CTPA is not nothing really fancy. All it is, is I'm taking an image of the pulmonary trunk when contrast is in it, okay? So that's how we, that's how we name things. A CT aorta would be when we, put, when we, when we take an image of the, the thorax when contrast is in the aorta, right? Or for example, um, a CT abdomen and pelvis scan with contrast, which we'll talk about later, is when we take an image of the abdomen and pelvis when the contrast is in the, the liver or the portal veins. So the names, I remember when I was in med school, I, didn't, I thought they were just like very specific, you know, high-tech procedures that no one knows what they're talking about. But look, it's all, all it is is timing of the contrast. So CTPA will happen when you take the timing at the level of the pulmonary trunk. So now, if there was a clot here, it'll be very easy to see, it'll be a filling defect. Um, that's why contrast is our friend. And now we're a bit lower now. Now we have the heart. And the way to tell the heart what chambers are what, um, I remember I found this really tricky when I started radiology. Um, but the key, some concepts are very common. The most anterior chamber is the, the right ventricle. So just imagine the heart is sitting on the left-hand side, on the, on the left hemidiaphragm. The most anterior chamber will be the right ventricle. If we know that, we can identify that the, the the more thicker walled ventricle is going to be the left ventricle. You have the intraventricular septum, and then you have this thick wall left ventricle. Then naturally, we will know that just above the, the left ventricle will be the left atrium. So the left atrium is the most posterior chamber of the heart. And then above the right ventricle will be the right atrium. Okay, very easy. So just remember the, the, the right ventricles at the front and then work yourself clockwise. And it's very easy to determine that. Um, and this view is important because when sometimes we have PEs, we need to know the right ventricular strain pattern. 
So the way we do that is we mention we measure the right ventricle and left ventricle uh, diameters. Normally they should be about the same. If not, the left ventricle should be a bit high, longer. But if someone's got a PE, uh, we want to see evidence of a strain to the heart. We can basically simply put an, uh, an arrow there, measure this, measure that, and create a ratio between right ventricle and left ventricle ratio. And if the, if that's higher on the right compared to the left, we can say the patient's got. Uh, hemodynamic instability or right heart compromise secondary to the pulmonary embolus. So that's how we see. So basically CT is pretty brilliant at telling you uh, lot, lots of things. So I've talked a lot, rambled a lot about anatomy. Now let's talk about pathology. So uh, this is a scan taken at the level of the, um, the bifurcation of the trachea right here. You can see the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus here. You see the ascending order here. So I would like you to, I would like you to tell me what pathology is going on here. So if you could open the poll, please. Okay. Yeah, let's close the poll. Yeah, great. Let's see what people say. Oh, brilliant. Majority of people say PE. And the reason we say it's PE, very good spot, because it's a very uh, important case not to miss. Okay, so this is a pulmonary trunk, right and left. You can see this, this linear filling defect extending from the left pulmonary uh, artery to the right pulmonary artery. And we call this a saddling appearance. So this is a saddle pulmonary embolus, which is causing a filling defect um, within uh, th throughout both pulmonary arteries. Now you guys realize the importance of giving contrast. So let's say the contrast was not given or the contrast was not timed well to reach the pulmonary trunk, we will not be able to appreciate this filling defect. So that's why having, that's when, you know, when you see a radiologist and we say, oh, the scan was inadequate or it's difficult to interpret. It's because sometimes the, con the timing is not great and the contrast does not fill the pulmonary vessels that well. Um, so that's a great example of a pulmonary embolus. Okay. How about this one? Slightly tricky. Very impressed if you guys get this. Um, but another really import, important thoracic pathology not to miss. All right, let's close the poll. Ooh, split, split. So people have got an idea that this is an aortic dissection, but which one is it? Type A or type B? So let's talk about it. So the reason it's an aortic dissection. So when I was when I was in uh, med school, I remember I didn't appreciate that. Aort I used to think aortic dissection means that the wall of the aorta has ruptured. That's not what it means. That's aortic rupture. Aortic dissection is essentially where the walls of the aorta separate. So if you remember from your basic path pathology, the, the walls of a vessel, you have tunica intima, the most, med the most uh, uh, medial layer, then the tunica media, which contains the muscle, and then the tun tunica adventitia. So what aortic dissection basically means, you have, it, it means that you have a shearing force between the most medial layer, which is the tunica intima, and the tunica media, which means that the tunica intima, which you see here, separates from the tunica media. So you can see that here as well. So this tunica intima, which we call the intimal flap, it will separate from the wall of the aorta, okay? And so you, you, get, you get this intimal flap with blood filling inside the wall of the aorta, if you can imagine, in between the tunica intima and tunica media. So we, we get this characteristic appearance of a double lumen sign. It looks like the aorta has two lumens, one here and one here. And the way to tell which is the true lumen, true lumen means the one which actually was supposed to be the right lumen, is the one which has most normally, which has most contrast in it. So this one was the true lumen. And you can see here, the tunica intima has sheared off from the left-hand side, from the right-hand side. And blood is starting to pool inside that. Now that's what you call an aortic dissection. To know if it's A or B, A is one which is at the level of the aortic arch. Okay, so this one is extending from the ascending aorta all the way down into the descending aorta. So this is type A, and type B is only which um, you, is only affecting the descending aorta, the descending thoracic aorta. Okay, so this is a type A aortic dissection. This is more of an emergency, 
um, because this will need surgical repair, whereas type B aortic dissections can be treated simply with um, blood pressure control. And another thing to appreciate here, we have the intimal flap, we had two lumens, but we also have enlargement of the aortic root, so the beginning of the ascending aorta. And normally, if you, if you were to appreciate that compared to the previous scan, that is how about three millimeters is what the aortic uh, ascending aorta should be. All right, so that's type aortic dissection. Now, moving on to the last case of the, the thorax, um, what do you think this, this is? Excellent. Let's stop the poll. Ooh, yes, so majority of you guys go right. This is a mediastinal tumor. So we, what we see here is this soft tissue lesion. So it's the same density, kind of a bit, maybe a bit less than the muscle. So it's a soft tissue lesion with this low density thing here, which is likely to be fat. It's kind of in between this and this. So it's more likely to be fat. This is fat, by the way, right here. So a soft tissue lesion, uh, which has contains fat and soft tissue, and it's abutting the aortic arch on the anterior aspect of the mediastinum. And so that's a mediastinal, very classic for a mediastinal tumor. Now, when that happens, um, there's, there's, com there's the way to remember what types of mediastinal tumors are common in the anterior mediastinum. We can learn something known as the four T's. The four T's are thymus, thymus tumors in young individuals, thyroid tumors, teratomas, which are germs or, or other germ cell tumors, or terrible lymphomas. Um, so this was an example of a teratoma because it contains two separate uh, lineage tumors. It contains a fat-containing uh, lipomatous region as well as a soft tissue component. So it's most in keeping with a teratoma, but very difficult to tell on radiology. What we need is definitive, definitive diagnosis with a biopsy. But when you see an appearance like this, which is not supposed to be there, think about the four T's, all right? So my last talk, very briefly, is going to be on CT abdomen and pelvis anatomy. Um, do we have any questions at the moment? No, we don't, great, um, fine. Um, so, CT abdomen and pelvis is a bit more complicated. So I don't expect any of you guys to learn CT abdomen and pelvis that well. But having an appreciation of where things are can help you a bit, especially when you have a, um, a clinical suspicion of a thing, you can directly look at that area. So starting off from the top left, we have a big organ here, which is the liver. Um, the liver basically takes up most of the abdomen. We have the right kidney here, just um, posterior and inferior to the right liver. We have a S-shaped organ here, just posterior to the liver, um, slightly less dense, and it's called the pancreas. On the left of the liver, we have this gas filled structure here, which we're just imaging here, which is called the stomach. We have this organ here, similar density to the liver, which is the spleen on the left-hand side. And then this is the aorta, abdominal aorta, because it's, it travels slightly left of the midline. And then this big structure here, very close and posterior to the liver, and on the left-hand side of the aorta is the inferior vena cava. Okay, so that's important to note. So this is a contrast enhanced CT abdomen and pelvis, and it's in the portal venous phase. Um, where the reason it's portal venous is because you can see some contrast in the aorta, some in the venous, and some also in the portal veins as well. So it's a lot, the, what's happened here is that the contrast has enough time to go into the rest of the organ. So we can, they light up a bit better and we can see things better. Now we're going a bit more down in the liver. So this structure here, right next, inferior in, uh, to the right lobe of the liver and abutting it is the gallbladder. And this, this uh, walls off structure containing gas, which travels on, uh, in the right-hand side on the lateral, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side on the lateral aspect of the left kidney is known as the descending colon. And if we move a bit more down, we see this structure here, which is traversing the anterior aspect of the abdomen, which is the transverse colon. We see the cecum in the right uh, iliac fossa and this tubular structure coming right off the cecum. If you can appreciate this small tubular structure right here, that's the appendix. So having an appreciation of the anatomy helps a lot. Um, 
So this is, I'm just going to go through the cases because uh, I think uh, with, with the interest of time and it's quite complicated um, as well. So this is a case of acute cholecystitis. And the reason I say that is because you can see the gallbladder, compare this to the previous gallbladder. Normally gallbladders are thin walled. The wall should be less than three millimeters. This wall is relatively thick and you can also see this fat stranding. So stranding of the fat, fat is uh, in the abdomen is black. So all this, not uh, this, this type of black, really, really black is uh, gas in the bowel, but that intermediate black area here, as well as here is fat, because fat is not that dense. So when you have stranding of the mesenteric fat, it indicates that there's inflammation going on from a structure. So that can be one of the criteria we use to find out what organs are uh, affected. So you see the gallbladder, which is thick walled, and you can see a pericholecystic fat stranding. And these are typical features of acute cholecystitis. Remember, if you remember from our previous talk, you can't sometimes see gallstones um, on the CT unless they're calcified. Um, so just sometimes you're very limited by just the appearance of the wall and the fat stranding to diagnose acute cholecystitis. And in early phases, we might miss it on the CT. But on an ultrasound, we can tell quite clearly if it's a gallstone. This is a pathology of a patient who comes in with right iliac fossa pain. Um, as you can see here, you have got a axial and a coronal view of the abdomen. And the thing that automatically strikes my attention as a radiologist is this tubular structure here in the right iliac fossa coming off the cecum, which has a very, very bright wall, if you can appreciate that. It's a very bright wall. It's quite thickened and edematous, and there's a bit of fat stranding in the surrounding fat here. And anatomically, I know that this is the appendix. So the features are in keeping with acute appendicitis. So that's what the features we look for. We look for a thick walled appendix with periappendiceal fat stranding. And sometimes we can see fluid around the pancreas. Common things to comment on when you see an appendicitis is, are, is there a collection and is there a perforation? And the way to tell that is we'll have to image the abdomen in different views and see if, is there any gas outside the bowel, which will, show us that the appendix, appendix is perforated. And in this case, you can't really see any gas surrounding. It's just fat stranding. And we also have to see if there's an abscess surrounding the appendix, appendix, because then that makes surgical options quite difficult because surgeons won't, won't like to operate on an abscess. They would, like, they would rather the abscess resolve or get drained before they take the appendix out because the, once they open the tummy up for a surgery, the surgery can get quite complicated if there's other complications like that. So it's very important to comment on two important things, abscess, perforation in, in, in the context of appendicitis. Um, now, this is an elderly lady. Uh, she comes, comes in with uh, diarrhea and she comes in with, uh, with low abdominal pain, a very common presenting feature. And what I can, what, if I was to show you, if I was to show you this scan in the axial phase, it can be quite difficult to appreciate, but you can see this ill-defined stranding around this part of the bowel. And if you can appreciate here on the coronal view, this part of the bowel has outpouchings and these outpoundings are called diverticuli. So you can see stranding within what we call the sigmoid colon because it's an S-shaped bowel coming off the descending colon, okay? It's got outpouchings, which are diverticuli and it's got fat stranding and it's inflamed. We, the reason we know it's inflamed is because A, the wall is very thick the wall is very, very thick. It's more than three millimeters. It's about four, five, six millimeters. You can see fat stranding. So these are features in keeping with diverticulitis. So that's how a diverticulitis looks like. So similar to appendicitis, it's not only important to mention that diverticulitis is there, but it's also important to comment on any other complicating features, which may, might make surgical management a bit more challenging. And two important things to mention with diverticulitis, like appendicitis, is perforation. Can you see any gas outside the, uh, the bowel, which can be quite difficult to appreciate, especially when you have lots of diverticuli. But, um, and, uh, and sometimes you can have very small perforations, which you don't see, which isn't a big problem because normally they will heal up um, and it will, you, they might not need surgery at that point. But sometimes you see big amounts of air in the, stomach, in, in the bowel, so in the abdomen, and then, you, you, then you're confident that's a big perforation. On, on top of this, you have, uh, you have to comment on if there's a collection. And 
we also have to comment on, what, comment on whether it's fistulating with any other organs. So diverticulitis, if you remember from your textbooks, li likes to inflame nearby structures and cause um, indirect joining of them, which is known as fistulation. Um, and that, that normally happens with either the colon, which is known as a, um, other parts of the colon, which is a enterocolonic fistula, or it could be a colovesical fistula where you can have fistulation with the bladder. So that's two important, three important things to talk about. So now this is a case, this is now a case which looks frankly abnormal. So if I was to see this, I would be, you know, calling the surgeons up straight away because what, if you were to appreciate from the other scans, the amount of gas that happens in the normal bowel and the normal abdomen versus this one, you can notice that there's something bad going on. So this is the liver here. The liver is very smooth in contour, but in front of the liver, you see lots of gas here. And this region here is the falciform ligament. So you can see gas surrounding the falciform ligament and superficial to the stomach as well. So there's some sort of perforation uh, going on here. So, so this patient has perforated. Now to find out where they've perforated. What we see here is we see this collection of fluid adjacent to the gallbladder. So we know there's some fluid component to this perforation. So whatever's causing this perforation is leaking fluid. And the way to determine where the perforation is coming from is A, anatomy. And B, where do you see locules of gas? So I see locules of gas around the lesser, lesser curvature of the stomach in the lesser sac, uh, adjacent from the liver to the, uh, which is basically the anatomical landmark between the liver and stomach. So this is definitely some sort of gastric or early duodenal perforation causing locules of gas here, leakage of contents of the stomach in the, in, around the gallbladder fossa and causing large amounts of pneumoperitoneum. Um, so this is a gastric perforation. This will need um, urgent surgical referral for uh, uh, so, so laparotomy and surgery. And perhaps also washout because imagine all these stomach contents within the stomach, they can also cause downstream perforation elsewhere. Very important to know. So if you ever see loads of gas above the liver, think, is this abnormal? That's the, the take home message I, need, I want to give you guys. Um, and I think these are, this is one of the last few cases I've got. So this is a case so a patient comes with absolute constipation. Um, and what you notice here already, if you were to look uh, from, you know, as a one, one second look, you see that the bowel is very, very dilated. So these are loops of small bowel. We know that they're small bowel because they're centrally located and they contain valvular conniventes. So these are small bowel loops which are dilated more than three centimeters and they're fluid filled and they're air filled. Okay, so these are features in keeping with small bowel obstruction. Now, it's very important that you can, when, when you mention the word obstruction, you also find the cause for the obstruction. That's not good enough as a radiologist or um, and the surgeons would not want to know just that, you know, it's an obstruction. They would want to know where roughly we need to target. And the way to do that is we, as radiologists, spend a long time following the bowel and seeing where there's an abrupt change in caliber of the bowel. So if I was to show you, I've taken a, a specific slice here. This patient's got lots of dilated bowel loops. And when, you, when we go down to the terminal ileum, so this is the cecum, and around this area, you can see that this is a this is dilated bowel, but right here, this region here, the, the small bowel quickly abruptly tapers. And this, this will be way more, you'll be able to appreciate this more when you actually follow the bowel in person. And this is what we call a transition point. So we need to mention the transition point of when there's an abrupt caliber change of the bowel. So this is a patient with small bowel obstruction with a focal transition point at the level of the terminal ileum. So this key, this chap could have potentially Crohn's disease, cause, uh, which, which has caused this uh, upstream small bowel dilatation. But another important thing to note is people often who have post-surgery can also have dilated bowel. So dilated bowel is not always a bad problem. You can be constipated. You might not be opening your bowel. You might have ileus post-operatively and this that may look exactly like this but what differentiates an ileus from a, an obstruction is the abrupt transition so if i can find a transition point i will say it's an obstruction if if it's smooth if it smoothly likes to taper off but very smoothly so let's say it starts off as, as five millimeters and then goes to uh, so five centimeters and then goes to four then three then two and then one and it's tapering off then we say that's very characteristic of an ileus. That's because of the bowel trying to undergo peristalsis. 
So I wouldn't call that an obstruction. You need to see, you need to see an abrupt transition point. Um, so common causes of small bowel obstruction are um, me mechanical small bowel obstruction, uh, secondary to adhesions. You can have hernias. So very important when you have small bowel obstruction to look for hernias. You can sometimes see them in the uh, abdominal wall. And you can also get, like, like in this case, you can see a patient with Crohn's disease called uh, secondary to ter terminal ileitis and fibrous stenotic disease. This is a patient, um, oh, sorry, I gave you the answer, but this is a patient with essentially, we've taken arterial phase imaging of the aorta. You can see that the aorta, the, the abdominal aorta contains contrast. You can see that there's a big um, homogenous and homogeneously enhancing um, collection here, which is in intermediate density. It's not as bright as the contrast, but it's not as bright and uh, not as dark as the fat. So this is what, is what we call blood. This is basically density of blood, okay? It's, it's clotted blood or, or hematoma here, but we also see that this streak of blood coming out from this part of the aorta. So this little streak in the arterial phase with this clot, clot, clotting of blood is typical for an abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture. And we know it's a rupture because the, bowel, the wall of the aorta has completely uh, rup, uh, been ruptured. It's not like a dissection where there's an intimal flap, where there's a shearing of the in, inner wall of the, um, the vessel. So this, if, if, you, if you see this, you need to basically drop everything you do, okay? Um, call the radiologist if they haven't seen it already and tell them to report it and in, involve the vascular surgeons immediately because you need to take this person to theatre immediately. I, I had a case literally two days ago. Luckily, the patient survived. Um, but, you know, these people often have really poor prognosis because when, once the uh, aneurysm is ruptured, what happens is, is when, when, when you close and repair the aneurysm, sometimes you can get uh, secondary ischemia to the gut. And later on, what they develop in ITU is ischemic compromises and ischemic bowel. So uh, very, very poor prognosis, but important to identify and can come up in neuroski. Um, they'll just show you a picture like this and be like, what, what is this? And all they would want to hear is I see contrast extravasating from the aorta into the mesentery and into the retroperitoneum, retroperitoneal space. Um, and there's a collection or hematoma here. This is in keeping with an abdominal aortic aneurysm rupture. And I will involve the vascular cells immediately. Yeah. And this is a bit more tricky. Pancreatitis. Now, pancreatitis is, um, if you remember from your um, your surgical pathology, uh, pancreatitis has many causes. Uh, so you can have that surgical sieve known as eye get smashed. Um, so the commonest two causes of pancreatitis are gallstones and alcohol. Um, and the work pancreatitis sometimes in the early setting uh, clinically presents with acute abdominal pain with the raised amylase. And, you, and then you think, okay, could this patient have pancreatitis? So you, the, the main thing to know is a CT scan in the early phase may not be the best thing because to actually see the features of pancreatitis, you might need about 48, 72 hours. It might even appear normal in the first 24 hours. So this is a patient who had a CT scan about 72 hours later, and he was managed with pancre for pancreatitis with fluids and NG tubes and all whatnot. And what you see is the pancreas here is very ill-defined. You can see stranding in the fat. So if you see this fat here, Within the, me within the mesentery, it's quite dark. It's quite, it has a bit of streaks, but that's just ir irregularity of the fat. But if you see here, there's a lot of streakiness there in, in the fat. It's much more dense. The fat is much more dense. And that's what we call fat stranding. It's where you have inflammation of the fat and it becomes a bit more dense. So you have peripancreatic fat stranding. You see a bit of fluid around the pancreas. So peripancreatic fluid. What you also see here is just here, just below the stomach, you see this well-defined collection. Um, it's a fluid collection. It looks like a cyst almost. So we call that pseudocyst in the, in the pancreas. So that's a complication of acute pancreatitis, pseudocyst formation. So you see a pseudocyst here. And it's also important to appreciate that this patient also has a very, very uh, dirty looking um, stranding, strandy gallbladder. So the gallbladder wall is a bit thicker and it's also stranding around the gallbladder. So what this patient could have, which is very difficult to appreciate on this scan, he could have a gallstone at the ampulla of vata. 
So the junction between the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct. And that may cause upstream cholecystitis or cholangitis with pancreatitis. And we see stranding of both structures. So it's a very good case. And on top of this, we also have a pseudocyst. So these are some of the features you need to look out for when you look for pancreatitis. Does the pancreas look stranded? Does it have fluid? How's the gallbladder? Are there any cysts? And in the later stages of pancreatitis, you might see necrosis of the pancreas. And remember what I said about dying tissue. Dying tissue looks less dense. So therefore, sometimes you might see, which you can't really appreciate here, because you don't see real findings of necrosis, but you can sometimes see areas which are very, very hypodense within the pancreas. And that, that's an example of pancreatic necrosis. So the learning points, so hope, hopefully I haven't run too over, too over um, but the learning points from my talk are that anatomy and pathology, having a strong understanding of where things are placed and what things can present, can give you a great understanding of radiology. CT is very useful in the acute setting. It's not very good for looking at within soft tissue, what if you fail to characterize a cancer, for example, or characterize a tumor, MRI is much better at doing that, but it's good to actually tell us if there is something there or not, especially with contrast. Denser structures appear white because they absorb more x-rays, less than structures appear black and absorb less x-rays. We can use contrast to evaluate things better and fat stranding, which is inflammation of the mesentery, can help us focus and target on a pathology. And uh, some, sometimes that's the only thing we have uh, helping us to find out what this patient has. So I hope I haven't you know, bored you to death. Um, this is quite complicated. I don't expect you guys to you know, understand CT by any stretch of the imagination. Even I'm still a trainee, I'm learning as I go along. But if you have an appreciation of where things are, you can, you can basically uh, target and you know, maybe before even the report comes out, you can as an FY1 or FY2 have a good idea what you're looking at. Um, and it will show, especially when you go to speak to a radiologist, um, it will show that this person has a lot of interest in this field and will help you guys quite a lot. So thank you. Um, let's see if you guys have any questions. Not 